Praise the Lord. We are very grateful to God for another opportunity like this to fellowship with our fathers and mothers and brothers and sisters in this wonderful PIWC Sakumono. Amen. Um, first of all, let me sincerely thank God for our revered apostle, Quartin. Um, he's my landlord. So, um, when it came that I have to respond to his assignment, who am I? Otherwise, me and your baby, nah. I'm very grateful to him and uh, Mama Eunice. We've had a wonderful stay for the last uh, four years. Um, now en route to missions. Uh, but we are grateful for his life. And then I want to thank the leadership of the church. Um, outgoing presiding elder and incoming presiding elder. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm really, really grateful uh, for the opportunity. Uh, Adam Purdue was telling me that finally, first I got you. Um, and Elder Johannes, thank you so much. And then Anthony, I'm really, really grateful. And then the other leadership, I salute you all. Um, it's an honor. I, I don't take it for granted at all. I think that it's a great privilege, and uh, I really want to appreciate you. And then on a Friday night like this, um, making time to come and pray, I really want to appreciate you. I'm sure under normal circumstances, you should have been relaxing in bed. These days, too, the weather is very, very, very nice for good sleep, but you have denied yourself sleep to be gathered here and God would definitely reward you for that. Amen. Amen. Um, I bring you special greetings from my wife, uh, Patricia. I'm sure by now she's watching on Facebook. And then um, I also came with some of my young friends in our church. Uh, we moved together. Um, my deputy women's leader is here, Dickness Elmion. Yeah. Yes. And then two of my prayer combatants are also here. We have Dickin Pakwisi Asari and then George AJ and of course Isaac. Yeah, so uh, we want the PIWC anointing to rub off on us so that we can take it back to Bethel. Amen. But the Lord will bless us tonight. And uh, we will never leave this place the same. Amen. Blessed be the Lord who reigns forevermore. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Blessed be the Lord who reigns forevermore. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Blessed be the Lord. Blessed be the Lord. Who reigns forevermore. Hallelujah. 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 Blessed be the Lord, say, blessed be the Lord, who reigns forevermore. Hallelujah. Let's pick it up. Hallelujah. Blessed be the Lord, say, blessed be the Lord, who reigns Let's be the Lord. 
And the Lord visited Sarah as he has said. And the Lord did for Sarah as he had spoken. We want to lift up our voice. Lord, visit me as you have said. Yes. Do for me as you have spoken. Lift up your voice and say, Lord, visit me as you have said. Do for me as you have spoken. In the name of Jesus, visit me as you have said. Do for me as you have spoken. Lift up your voice and begin to pray. Visit me as you have said. Do for me as you have spoken. In the name of Jesus, visit me as you have said. Do for me as you have spoken. Raise your voice and begin to pray. In the name of Jesus, let tonight be my night. That you visit me as you have said. And do for me as you have spoken. In the name of Jesus, let tonight be my night. Let tonight be my night. My night of visitation. My night of encounter. My night of experience.
Chapter 66, God, verse 8. The Bible says that who has heard of such things and who has ever seen things like this? Jesus. Can a country be born in a day? Or a nation be brought forth in a moment? So this is a question that from the physical perspective, it is difficult to see that manifestation. But the prophet Isaiah says that yet yes. no sooner is Zion in labor. Good. The King James says that as soon as Zion travels uh, and you and I are citizens of Zion. Yes. The Bible says that out of Zion the perfection of beauty God has shined. Yes, Lord. So we have entered Zion Yes. And we carry the DNA of Zion ah. in our members. Yes, and as soon as we travel yes. as citizens and descendants of Zion, yeah. we shall bring forth her children. Yes, so if we want to even link it, it means that the children of Zion are nations. The children of Zion are countries. And the means by which we are able to travel and bring forth our children, our potentials, our abilities, yes. our capacities yes, is through the medium of prayer. Yes. Tonight, may the Holy Ghost release upon us yes. the spirit of traveling. Amen. May we become travelers to prevail yes, in the name of Jesus Amen. as we lift up our voice one more time. May there be an outpouring. Yes, May there be an outpouring yes, of the spirit of traveling. Of the spirit of traveling. Of the spirit of traveling. Yes, Raise up your voice one more time. In the name of Jesus. For the release of the spirit of traveling. In the name of Jesus. The spirit of traveling, 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 Ali Satire, Ali Makataya, Ali Masana, Pata 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 Pata
with hope standing by my side and faith and faith my only accord I will pray I will pray I believe I believe in the power of prayer with hope with hope standing by my side and faith I will pray. I will pray. One more time. I believe in the power. I believe in the power of prayer. With hope. Hope by my side. And faith. And faith. My only uncle. I will pray. I will pray. I believe. I believe. And God will answer, God will answer my prayer. I will pray. I will pray. Let's sing the song with confidence. And God will answer my prayer. I will pray. God will answer my prayer. I will pray. I will pray. God will answer. God will. Shall we please be seated? I will pray. I will pray. God will answer my prayer. Ele bakataya. I will pray. God will answer my prayer. God will answer my prayer. I will pray. For Zion's sake, I will not keep silent. For Jerusalem's sake, I will not remain quiet till her vindication shines out like the dawn. Tonight, the Lord will vindicate you and set you apart as a man unleashed, as a woman unleashed, till her salvation is like a blazing touch. The nations will see your vindication and all kings your glory. You will be called by a new name. The Lord will give you a new name. For denying your sleep and coming here, the Lord will give you a new name. If once upon a time they were calling you a disgrace, the Lord will call you a royal diadem. You will get a new name, a new identity, a new portfolio. In this atmosphere of prayer, as you lift up your voice, there will be an echo.
sex change tonight. And a new name shall be given to you. You shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel. For as a man, you have wrestled with God and man, and you have prevailed. A new name. A new name. He says that the mouth of the Lord will be stowed. You will be called a crown of splendor in the Lord's hands. A royal diadem in the hand of your God. No longer will they call you deserted or name your land desolate. But you will be called Hephzibah. Oh, you are not here. You will be called Hephzibah. Fruitful. Abundance. Increase. Overflow. Hephzibah. May that become your portion in the name of Jesus. I've not started. We are just preparing the grounds. Hallelujah. Anyway, I realized that when I stood here, I've seen some familiar faces here, so it means that I'm home. Uh, my brother Alex is here. Alex, we grew up together in Kofodia. Uh, and Alex, and Alex. You no, know, on this pulpit, there are certain things is for the box. The treasure box, I won't release it here. <laughs> but but we, we were together. We used to attend come meetings together. And they would put us on a long fast. And we'll be suffering. We're looking into each, each other's face. Today, at Alex. <laughs> and Pastor Anno. And I see my brother George. George, so good to see you. Oh, it's, it's, it's a joy. It means that this is home. So I can feel free. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Amen. Tonight, let's do some teaching and then we can pray. The theme for the program is Unleashed to Possess the Nations. And I want to emphasize tonight on what I have entitled Unleashed in the Grace and Power of God. Unleashed in the Grace and Power of God. I'll need the keyboardist to be touching the key for me. And the musicians, I want to humbly plead that you'll be around. We'll be working together. Covenant Asante. I know Covenant too. Yeah, I know Covenant too. And then Prince, and then Cynthia, yeah. So I am home. Unleashed in the grace and power of God, Acts chapter four, verse thirty-three. Let's begin from there. Acts chapter four, verse thirty-three. Then we will do Obadiah twenty-one. Acts chapter four, verse thirty-three. We'll do. Obadiah 21, and then we'll add 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 8. All right. So, Acts chapter 4, verse 33. The Bible says that, and with great power, the apostles gave witness to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus and great grace was upon them all. With great power, the apostles gave witness to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus and great grace was upon them all. Tonight, may we be positioned for great power and great grace. Obadiah chapter 21, verse 21, sorry. Obadiah verse 21. 
then saviors will come to Mount Zion to judge the mountains of Esau and the kingdom shall be the Lord's. Then saviors will come to Mount Zion to judge the mountains of Esau and the kingdom shall be the Lord's. Hallelujah. Saviors unleash to possess the nations means saviors are about to be released. And I pray that when the clown call is made, may you and I be one of them. Hallelujah. Second Corinthians chapter 9. Chapter 9, verse 8. He says that, and God, and God, and God, and God, and God, and God is able to make all grace abound towards you. All grace. That you, always having all sufficiency, in all things may have an abundance for every good work. And God is able to make all grace tonight. May you become a recipient of all grace. May you become a beneficiary of all grace. May you become a custodian of all grace. May you become a reservoir of all grace. May you become a haven of all grace. And God is able to make all grace. Grace to speak. Grace to study. Grace to reflect. Grace to marry. Grace to raise children. Grace to invest. Grace to seek for contracts. Grace to travel. Grace to relate grace to abound in every good work tonight may the Lord release grace 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 all grace all All. greater grace abounding grace overflowing grace superfluous grace mind blowing grace receive grace I said receive grace 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 grace. and God is able God is able to do just what he said he would do. He's gonna fulfill every promise to you. Don't give up on God, cause he won't give up on you. He's able. And God is able. One of the attributes of God that that he does not share with humanity is his omnipotence. His awesome power. His awesome grace. His awesome ability. God is not in short supply of power. His power knows no bounds. He is the embodiment of unlimited power. At the stretch of his hands, power at the blast of his nostrils power even when God sneezes powers on earth catches cold and tonight this God is able I said this God is able to release power to release grace to release ability unto the church and I came to announce to you that tonight you have come to subscribe to all surpassing power you have come to apply and receive all surpassing grace and the one that is going to give it to you his economy is not affected by any variable 
because he sits enthroned upon the circles of the earth and the inhabitants are like grasshoppers. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. Everything belongs to him. All power. One day, the psalmist says that, Psalm 66 verse 12, he said that once has God spoken and twice have I heard that all power all power all power all power and that is the reason why one day our founding father sang this song to me I was so in the answer say to me I will him and the punia menina what could you do? What people can say? I can to me, I was so Ni to me, I was so Oh, he can see it. Jesus Christ. Hey, Jesus can I get the symbols? Jesus Christ. Yeah, the way you know. I love my coni. Jesus Christ. In the Maya. Jesus Christ. Ay, 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 Jesus Christ. into the face of the psalmist and said that I am the Lord God who brought you out of Egypt open your mouth wide and I'll fill it because in God is vested all power all power all power haven't you heard this song Jesus power super power Jesus power super power Jesus power, super power. Jesus power. You know, those of us who went to SU. When you go for prayer meetings and you realize that the atmosphere is becoming dull, then our prayer leader will scream, hey! If we'll be asked some then he will raise the song. Supernatural power, super power, incomparable power, super power, Jesus power, super power. The one that we have come to, he is the superlative of all power. The extent of his power cannot be measured cannot be assessed, cannot be calculated, we cannot bring to terms the description to place on it. It is beyond. We are caught in awe when even a figment of his power drops on us. We are caught in awe. We are, we are held spellbound. He's powerful. He's powerful. But he is able to dispense that dimension of his power and invite us to participate in it. The Bible says that his divine power has given us all things that pertains to life and godliness. And tonight, he is throwing an invitation to us to partake of this power then we can be unleashed to go and possess the nations. Hallelujah. You know, we are living in a world that is fested with all kinds of issues, challenges, and problems. Ghana, we have our own. Companies have their own. As individuals, we have our own. Our world is bedeviled with so much undesirable conditions and difficulties. Of course, the scripture has already said 
that in this world you will have many troubles. And indeed, we see it. Now, these conditions stare at us every now and then. This morning, whilst driving to work, I decided that I won't listen to radio. Because I realized that after a good quiet time in the morning, once I sit in the car in my attempt to listen to radio and drive to work, and from work, from the house to work is a bit far. And you may meet you know, it 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 intoxicates my spirit. So I decided that this morning, me in tea radio, me bonyum. Why? Because the situations around us is not pleasant. It's undesirable. It's not something that we wish for. It's not something that we pray for. But these are the realities that are confronting us. And it is into these realities we are being commissioned as unleashed men and women to go and possess. People are crying when is deliverance coming. People are wailing. People are sobbing. People are knocking their heads. People are at their wit's end. There seem to be no answer. We have become like a people who are sitting in darkness and groping by the wall and are not able to find our way. Where is the door of escape? This is the world we are living in. But it is into this world that God has laid it upon the leadership of this, our church, that we are being unleashed. Why? We have the answer. We have the solution. And tonight, it is my humble prayer that God will stir in us that answer. He will stir in us that solution. It will come out. This evening, I read a quote from our chairman. It was a flyer. He said that when our ministry does not become supernatural, it will not confound the world. Our dear chairman, he said that when our ministry does not become supernatural, it will not confound. Because the world that we are living in today is a world that is asking for a supernatural intervention. And that kind of supernatural intervention will come through men and women who have been empowered by the grace and power of God and unleashed. Tonight, may you be located. May you be selected. May you be identified as a man of grace. A man of power to step out of your world to be able to transform your world. And it is in the light of these challenges that God is calling on us. In Joel chapter 2, the prophet Joel has a very interesting revelation from the verse 1 to 4. He says that blow the trumpet in Zion. Sound my alarm on the holy hill. He says that let the inhabitants of the land tremble for the day of the Lord is at hand. Verse 2. He says that it is a day of darkness and gloom. A day of blackness and clouds. He says that like the mountain clouds spread over the mountains, a people great and strong are coming. And tonight, we are that people. We are that people. We are that people. We are that people. He says that the people who are coming, such like them has never been before. Neither would it ever be that they will come. Then he goes further to say that before them, a fire divorce, and behind them, a flame bangs. He said that nothing shall escape them. He said that in front of them, the land is like the land of Eden, but behind them, it's like a desolate land. 
I like the verse 4. He said that they have the appearance of horses and they gallop like cavalry. This is the army that the Lord is unleashing. And I thank God that you and I are part of that army. Some of us are generals in this army. Some of us are lieutenants in this army. Some of us are majors in this army. Some of us are lieutenant colonels in this army. Find your place in this army. And tonight, you will gallop like a cavalry. You will have the appearance of horses. Because the grace and power of God is about to come upon you. Hallelujah. What does it mean to unleash? On Monday, presiding elder and some of our mothers had a talk. I watched. Yeah, I watched. I watched the mid nose. <laughs> Unleashed. It means to be free from. It means to let loose. To let loose. The Bible says that Samson caught 300 foxes and tied their tails together and set them on fire and release them. Tonight, may the Lord bring us together and set us on fire and release us as men and women let loose. We are not going to be let loose to create havoc, but we are going to be let loose to convert and give life. Unleash means to be free from restraints, constraints, Oppositions, hurdles, obstacles, unleashed. Unleash means to unbind anything that is binding us. Presiding, or one of our brothers said that some chains are going to be broken. So to unleash means to unbind. It means to deliver. It means to alleviate. Unleash. Unleash. Unleash means to be released to create solutions. To become a leader and drive action to attain set goals. Unleash. Unleash means to assess new mantles. To work in new dimensions. To unlock new portals, to access new gates, and to open new doors. And tonight, may the Lord bring us to the place where we we'll access new portals, portals of glory, portals of grace, portals of increase, portals of solutions. May we enter into certain doors, any closed doors, because we are going to be unleashed. May we assess those doors in the name of Jesus. The Bible says that you shall stand at the crossroad and look and you hear a voice saying, this is the way, this is the door. Open it and assess it. May that become our story tonight in the name of Jesus. Assessing doors. Assessing gates. Assessing portals. Beloved, if you look at us as Christians or as children of God or as sons of the light, we are classified in two main categories. Number one, we are classified according to our identity in Christ. Our identity in Christ. We are a chosen generation called for to show his excellence. So our identity in Christ is that we are a chosen generation. We are a royal priesthood. We are a holy nation. The Bible says that he has made us joint heirs with Christ in God. We are a new creation. This is our identity. The Bible says that he has made us kings and priests to the glory of God the Savior. Revelation chapter 1 verse 5 and 6. We are. So that is our identity. Our identity is that we are more than conquerors. That is our identity. Our identity is that we are sons. 
Hitherto, we were not sons. He says that once upon a time, you were not a people, but now you are a people. Our identity in Christ. Our identity in Christ. And then we are also classified according to our function. Our function. Our function. So, we come to Christ to have our identity redefined and then our functions laid out for us. In Matthew chapter 5, verse 13, Jesus Christ teaching outlines one of our functions. Matthew chapter 5, verse 13. He says that you are the salt of the earth. That is our function. You are the salt of the earth. If the salt loses its flavor, how shall it be seasoned? It is then good for nothing but to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. 14. He says that you are the light. So we are salt. We are light. Then we are a city that is set on a hill. So our functions are being laid out here through the teachings of Jesus that we are salt. And what is the function of salt? Salt is to be able to preserve. Salt is to be able to flavor. It is only today we had a seminar in the office that the doctor said that we should be mindful of salt. But can you know, when they serve you meal and everything has been put in it, salt does not lose its relevance. Yet yet you are not going to be able to do it. You are not going to be And you know, those days when we used to learn catering, when they give you the recipe, the last end of the recipe is that add salt to taste. So a tasty life is a function of the salt that is in the life. And Jesus is saying that we are the salt of the earth. So the tastiness of the earth is a function of how much we are allowing our salt to salt the earth. Until we release the salt that is in us to salt the earth, our earth will not remain tasty. That is why he sends the word of caution that if our salt loses its flavor, then it does not become useful again, but it is thrown out and trampled. That will not be our story. Then he says that we are the lights of the world. We are the light. So it means that it is our presence which is enlightening the world. Oh, pastor, but when we wake up, we see that the world is already lighted. Yes. But there is a certain systemic dimension of the world that we are in. And that systemic dimension of the world that we are in, the people that are keeping that systemic dimension of this world that we are in, lighted is us. In 1 John chapter 5, Jesus, through the apostle John, said that the whole world lieth in darkness. But we are the light of the world. And so, as we are unleashed, we step into our world with our 200 watts, 1000 watts, solar watts, whatever watts we have. And as light, we brighten the corner wherever we are. You are the light. And the joy is that we are a city that is set on a hill. We are a city. And he said that it cannot be hidden. Listen, after tonight, may you not be put in a state of oblivion. May your relevance come forth. I said, may your relevance come forth. Wherever you work, wherever you are, may you not be unnoticed. May something about you be noticed. You are a city set on the hill. You are a city. 
You know, sometimes as Pentecostals, because of our uniqueness as classical Pentecostals, adherents of simplicity, sometimes it's difficult for us to be able to speak a bit big because we feel that if you speak big, you are demonstrating pride. This one, you are not speaking big to demonstrate pride. This is what the scripture is saying. You are a city. You are a city. So the next time you are mentioning your name to somebody, what is your name? My name is City. Kwesi Asante Ano. Is it a good place? Yeah. You are a city set on a hill. And the Bible says that you cannot be hidden. You cannot. You cannot. Even when they dig the earth and put you in and cover it, the searchlight will locate you. Amen. You are a city set on a hill that cannot be hidden. You are a city. And it is on the basis of this that we are asking God for grace and power to be able to function accordingly. So what is the grace of God? What is the grace of God? Number one, God's grace is God's boundless provision which he has offered lavishly to an obviously struggling entity. God's grace is God's boundless provision which he has offered lavishly to an obviously struggling entity. So, grace is the boundless provision of God which he has offered lavishly it means that the extreme dimension of God's benevolence has been released to an obviously struggling entity. Grace. Number two, I've written here that grace is the helping hand for a limping soul. Grace is a helping hand for a limping soul. Grace is a life jacket. For a drowning spirit. And grace is a footbridge for a weary heart. Grace. Then as I studied, I discovered what some theologians have also written about grace. One of them is Hampton Keithley. Hampton Keithley. And Hampton Keithley says that grace is the very foundation and fountain of true Christianity. So the very foundation and fountain of true Christianity is the grace of God. Is the grace of God. And then finally, grace is God's goodness and severity converging. God's mercy and justice uniting. God's love and power redeeming grace. God's goodness and severity converging. God's mercy and justice uniting. And God's love and power redeeming. Hallelujah. So what is the characteristics of God's grace? Number one, grace is a mystery. Grace is a mystery. Grace is a mystery. In Genesis chapter 30, verse 27, the uncle of Jacob is telling him something. He says that I have learned by divination that the Lord has blessed me for your sake. I have learned by divination. So when Jacob went into the house of Laban, even though Laban for 14 years was cheating him, Laban could not understand why this guy, I am cheating him, yet this guy is prospering. You know, so do you know what Laban did? Okohim, okohishim. Intimishishim. Enye nene shazio. 
Laban went to check through the back door of sorcery. And he says that I have learned by divination that the Lord has blessed me because of you. It means that the young man, Jacob, was in the house of Laban. And there was something mysterious. Eh? If it is not grace, which is a mystery, Jacob cannot work for 14 years for a woman. And the Bible says that it felt like this. You must be surrounded by a certain mystery called grace. Now, why any way do in fear do nine? And you can feel that it is just like this grace, the mystery of grace. Similarly, Genesis chapter 39, verse 3. The Bible says that Potiphar saw that the Lord was with him and that the Lord made all he did to prosper in his hands. This is about Joseph. The mystery of grace. The mystery. The, you see, a mystery is something that you cannot explain. Something that you cannot put your hand on. Something that you cannot really hold it in its tangibility. But you can see that it is upon a man. The grace. The grace. The Bible says that, and the boy Jesus grew in wisdom and in stature and in favor with men and with God. And the Bible says that, and the grace of God was with him. There is a mystery of God's grace that surrounds a man that makes him indescribable. Yet, he does things that causes people to be wondering what manner of man is this? What manner of woman is is this and I humbly beseech the message of God tonight in this atmosphere that by the time we live here may you become a mobile mystery may you become a walking wonder may something be around you which cannot be described or be it the grace of God grace of God a mystery a mystery you become a strange phenomenon you become a strange phenomenon. You get to the office and the office is in crisis. Then you tell your superior, give me five minutes. You enter your desk. You put your head down. Give me the problem. You hold the document. You look at it. And then suddenly, you begin to prescribe the solution. And your boss looks at you. And he's like, now, you are an embodiment of grace. You are a reservoir of grace. You are an entity of grace. You are a man of grace. You are a woman of grace. A mystery. A mystery. A mystery. You enter into that negotiating table, and the moment you sit at the table, you have not even opened your mouth. And already, you have started courting the affection of the one who is going to award the contract. And the people are like, oh, no, 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 we're a bribe. You have not given him bribe. No, you have not done that. But there is something fragrance which is oozing out of you. It is the grace of God. And when it comes into contact with any kind of entity, it affects the person. The grace of God. The grace of God. The mystery I have learnt by divination. I have learnt, I have seen that the Lord has blessed me because of you. Why? You are wearing a crown on your head. The grace of God. Number two. Grace is a mark. It's a mark. A mark. A mark is an identity. A uniqueness which sets two people apart. A mark. A mark. Here in Ghana, we have different categories of um, people from different groups. And you are able to use the mark that has been given 
on the person to tell where the person is coming from. These days, it's been stopped. But I'm sure you can tell by the mark that somebody has that he comes from here or comes from there. In the same way, the grace of God is a mark. It's a mark. It separates two people. It separates. When the grace of God is upon you and you are in a certain group, the grace will single you out and make you stand out and make you outstanding. That is it. In Genesis chapter 26, verse 12 and 13, the Lord himself revealed himself to Isaac in the land of Gera. Isaac wanted to go to Egypt. Then God spoke to him and said, don't go down to Egypt. Then God said, stay in the land because the grace of God as a mark is on you. And the Bible says that Isaac sowed in the land. And the Bible says that in the same year, you know, at that time, there was famine in the land. But a man who carries the mark of God's grace upon him is not bound by the prevailing conditions. The Bible says that when men say there is a casting down, you shall say there is a lifting up. Why? Because the mark of God's grace is upon you. So you are an embodiment of divine exemption. That is who you are. So Isaac sowed in the land. In the land. The same land that was not yielding fruits. The same land that was not producing harvest. The same land that was in crisis. Isaac sowed in that land. I tell people that, you see, when a nation is in crisis and we are in difficulties, as Christians, fine, as human as we are, we may talk. But the answer rests on us. As a church, we have the answer. You can stay in this Ghana. I was preaching in my church and I was telling them that dollar is now 10 Ghana, one dollar, right? Or 10.2 or 10 point. Hopefully, it will be arrested. But until it is arrested, it is going. It is going. Okay. But do you know that in this same Ghana that we are complaining one dollar, ten Ghana cities, and a dollar and a kosoro, and a dollar and a kosoro, there are people who are not feeling an inch, a pinch, a, a almond tick. No, almond tick. In 2 Kings chapter 6, the last verse, the Bible says that there was famine in the land of Samaria. And the king was so, so, so devastated because now people were killing their children and feasting on their children. And the king was so angry that he said that if by tomorrow the head of the prophet Elisha is on his head, then he is not a king. When you read the last bit, the Bible says that, but Elisha the prophet was sitting down and the people had surrounded him and he was talking. When I read that scripture, I said that, and then the people that are around him, because I want me, and that the people around you, it means the prophet was exempted, even though there was hunger in the city of Samaria. And that is the reason why he could prophesy tomorrow by this time. A, 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 an, a, an, a flower will cost a shekel and a barley will cost a shekel and the people were rushing out. Did you see Elisha rushing out? No. So in this same Ghana, the day dollar was 10 to 1 dollar, that very day, somebody imported 400 containers and cleared them at the port. That, that very day, that you and I were like, pray. So say, no, baby, you do it there. Yeah, whoa. The person was saying, cry your own cry. 
May the Lord appoint you for divine exemption by marking you as a man of grace. I told somebody that that very day, government announced that very day, it will not, it will, it will not be surprising for me to hear that that very day, somebody entered Toyota Ghana Limited showroom and bought four V8s. He didn't pay with post-dated check or kind scan or what, 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 what? That, that day. Why? There are people who are walking under a certain kind of cloud. And I want God to bring us there. And that cloud is the mark of the grace of God. Mark of the grace of God. When you read Numbers chapter 22, to 25, the Bible talks about Balak, the king of Bo Moab, and Balaam, the prophet. If you study that scripture carefully, you realize that Balak was afraid Israel were just passing. And he saw them as a mighty army. And so went and consulted this prophet called Balaam. And asked this prophet to come and place a curse upon Israel. Now, the prophet takes money and tells the king to stand by his burnt offering because he's going to consult God and come back. He goes and God speaks to him <laughs> that these people, they are untouchable. These people cannot be cursed. So when he comes, the first time he comes, he comes to tell um, the, the King Balak that these are unique people. And I so much appreciate the people that I want to die their kind of death. Say that let me die their kind of death. Hey, Obi Ametia Okase, Bedomi Omno, Upeso Uomu. Then he goes to convince the king again and goes back to consult. Now God tells him to come and tell the king that. These people are blessed. God has blessed them. And I cannot change it. That is where he went further and said, God is not a man that he should lie. Neither the son of man that he should repent. Has he said it? And will he not do it? Has he said it? And will he not do it? Hallelujah. Grace. So we have said that grace is a mystery. We have said that grace is a mark. Number three, grace is a mandate. It's a mandate. You reign, you ancient Zion King. Kadosh, Kadosh. You are mighty on your throne. You reign, you ancient Zion King. Kadosh, Kadosh, you are mighty on your throne. Grace is a mandate. A mandate is an official order or commission to do something. It is a decree. It is a directive. It is a command. A mandate. The grace of God is sanctioned from heaven. And we are bound by the sacred degree of God's grace. The Bible says that you are saved by grace, not of works, lest any man should boast. God has mandated us with the grace of God. In Genesis chapter 1, from the verse 26 to 28, God, out of his grace, created man. And when God, out of his grace, created man, the Bible says that God said, Blessed, be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth, and replenish it. Have dominion over the bears in the sky, the fish in the seas, and the animals in the forest. Man didn't do anything, but God just placed the mandate on him. Bam! It was like a stamp. Was like a stamp. Grace. It's a decree from heaven. The grace of God is a decree from heaven. God just finds us 
and give it to us. That is the reason why in Acts chapter 4, verse 33, as we read, he said that, and great grace was upon them. And great grace. God just mandated them and gave it to them. Bam! He just gave it to them. Just gave it to them. And tonight, when we lift up our voice to pray, may the heavens open over us. And may the mandate of God's grace be reenacted one more time. May the sacred decree fall upon us. But as we try to negotiate the curve and then terminate, I want to humbly suggest to you that the grace of God is free, but it is not cheap. The grace of God is free, but it is not cheap. And tonight, we will pay the price to get the grace of God. Why am I saying that? Assessing the grace of God sometimes comes at a cost. There is a price man must pay. In Luke chapter 6 verse 12, Jesus in his humanity understood that even though he came upon the surface of the earth as God man, he needed to always pay the price. And so the Bible says that Jesus would climb the mountain and spend all night praying. What was he praying about? Hebrews chapter 5 verse 7. The Bible says that during the days of his flesh, Jesus offered prayers and large, loud cries unto him that is able to deliver him. And the Bible says that he was heard in that he feared. He understood that though he is the embodiment of grace, it is not cheap. He must contend for the grace of God. My dear brothers, my dear sisters, my dear mothers, my dear fathers, there is an extent to which the secular world and our certificates can lead us to. But I dare say, with all humility, but that it can lead us to somewhere. But when the grace of God accompanies what you have acquired, there are certain hurdles you can cross. There are certain leaps and bounds you can reach. But you must contend for it. How do you contend for it? Number one, you must be hungry for the grace of God. You must be hungry. You must be hungry. Proverbs chapter 8 verse 17. The Bible says that I love those who love me. And those who seek me diligently shall find me. Diligently shall find me. I love those who love me. And those who seek me diligently shall find me. As the deer pant for the waters broke, so my soul pants after thee. In a dry and thirsty land, I look for thee. I search for thee. I will deny myself sleep on a Friday night because I am looking for the grace of God. I am hungry for the grace of God. I am thirsty for the grace of God. I will let sleep go so that I can assess grace. Hungry. Hungry. The Bible says in Jeremiah chapter 29, Verse 13, he said that you shall seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. You shall seek me and find me. One day, one man of God was saying that God is visible, but God is hidden. God is visible. Where two or three are gathered there, I am in their midst. So you can assess it from that perspective that God is visible. But if you want to press into the great I am, he is hidden. The Bible says that on the island of Patmos, God revealed himself 
to John the apostle. And when he heard the sound of the trumpet, God said, come up higher. Come up higher. Anytime God wanted to speak to Moses, Moses would have to climb the mountain and go and press him and press him. And that comes by hunger. Hunger. How much are you hungry for God? How much are you hungry for him? How much are you thirsty for him? The Bible says in Matthew chapter 5 verse 6, Blessed are they who thirst and hunger for righteousness, for they shall be filled. Hunger, hunger, hunger. Because in this kingdom, complacency is disaster. God is not excited when we are complacent. No. Have you asked yourself, why is it that the Bible says that the four living creatures and the 24 elders continue to lay their crowns? If Abraham started so many lay on my crowns, and yen ne. Why is it that they keep on? Because there are dimensions of God that continues to be revealed the more they press in. The more they press in. Apostle Professor Pogin now has a song. He says that I'm at the foot of the mountain, climbing higher to you. There are depths of knowing you. There are depths. So there are shades of God. There are dimensions of God. And you must be hungry. You must sustain that hunger. You must sustain that passion. You must sustain that desire. You must press in. Then you can get the grace. You must press in. Hunger is the driver of divine pursuits. That is what drives us. Hunger is the proof that we are alive. Hunger is the energy for motion. And I've written here that hunger is the hues on which faith rides to our desired destination. Hunger. Hunger. Moses would not have heard the voice if as he was a shepherd on the wilderness, he had not sustained hunger. Because if a burning bush is burning now, let it burn. But because of the sustained hunger, he said, I will go and see. Read that scripture very well. You realize Exodus chapter 3. The Bible says that when the Lord saw that Moses was climbing, then the Lord called him Moses. Moses. So God, he can remain where he is until you press him. When you press him, he will come. May the Lord ignite our hunger. May the Lord stir up our hunger. May the Lord raise a new hunger in us. Hunger. Hunger. Number two, if we will be able to walk in the grace of God, let go the arrival mentality. Let go the arrival mentality. Let go the arrival mentality. I've always been awed by the scripture in the book of Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 6. The Bible says that in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Then Isaiah goes on to talk and talk. Then Isaiah comes to a point where he says that, Woe is me, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among unclean people. And he says that, but my eyes have seen the king. And then the angel picks a live coal and touches his mouth. And says that, who shall I send? And who shall go? Then Isaiah says, here am I. Send me. Okay. So from Isaiah chapter 1 to Isaiah chapter 5, Isaiah, what were you doing? Because if Isaiah chapter 6, now you are saying, here am I. 
send me. So chapter 1 to chapter 5, Isaiah, who sent you? Isaiah, who called you? It means that there are dimensions into God. And until you let go the arrival mentality, you cannot get there. It means so right from the outset, Isaiah was called in the palace. Because when you start reading Isaiah chapter 1, he came with a bang. His, his prophecy was hot. To the extent that he said that even when Israel prays and asks God for forgiveness, he will not listen until they repent. Then he, Isaiah, said that, therefore, come let us reason together. Though your sin be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. But there was a point in chapter 6 where he will see the Lord and hear a voice and a call from heaven will touch his mouth and he will say, here am I, send me. Beloved, you knew you. We must let go the arrival mentality. You know, sometimes we feel that, oh, by the grace of God, I have come to church. God has given me a gift. At least, me image now. Oh, me preach it fine. Presiding at the cry, Jimmy D. Worship. Oh, me trying to say, Yopo. Me a utility player in the church. Me, yeah, the major chair. You know, in most churches, eh, we have key players who, when there is a major pro- pro- program, Nidim Baba program. I don't know whether you have seen in churches. That day, you no know, you look for your best shot. Not, not J Max. So those people, eh, if you are not careful, you would think that you have arrived because who no? Oh, a star player, Champions League now, but. So when the tournament is hot. When you say by all means, training or no training, selection back on your best friend. And if you are not careful, you will become mediocre. You will think that you have arrived. You see, when I read about the Apostle Paul, I am inclined to think that what are we doing? This is the Apostle Acts chapter 9. Had an encounter. He one man of God said that as for Paul, Jesus himself became his evangelist. Because there was no human being who could preach to Paul. So Jesus himself revealed himself to him. Met him direct. And for the rest of us. Me house to house evangelism. Some house to house evangelism. Na ya moye no. Me na ye bi ne ye mi o. Yes one kasa. Yes one kasa. And the bar me peswa so. Shai. Who quote John three sixteen? Do you know one kasa sin? Do you know so no 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 bar me ho. Yet, the Bible says that after the Damascus encounter. The man in Arabia received uncommon revelations. When you read Ephesians chapter 3, he said that I want to talk to you about the mystery that I was given. The mystery that I was given. I received it by revelation. You know, the apostle Paul was so much full of revelation that when everybody is in prison and crying, he in prison, he wrote. He wrote with his chains, he was writing. When you read Ephesians chapter 1, verse 1 to about 14, Greek writer says that it was a compound sentence. It was pregnant with so much revelation. And we have to break it small, small. Even the apostle Peter said that our brother Paul has been saying things which are hard to understand. Peter, on only yes, unanti you. Paul, who didn't work with Jesus physically, said that Paul has been writing things which are hard to understand. The man was a revelation personified. 
Yet, in Philippians chapter 3, the apostle Paul says that, for what was gained to me, I consider all of them loss compared to the surpassing knowledge of knowing Christ and being found in him. Then in verse 10, he said that after everything, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection. And I'm like, Paul, what else do you want to know? He was not ready to work with the arrival mentality. He kept pressing on. He kept pressing on. And that is the reason why when it was time for him to die, he knew that he was going to die. Sure. Paul is the one who they would prophesy to him that he's going to Jerusalem and he'll be bound. And you look at the head of church. I am not ready even to be bound. I am ready to die. And he will say, for me, to live is Christ. To die is gain. He said that I long to go, but for your sake, I will stay. This is the man. But in the midst of all this, no arrival thinking. But me and you, small revelation we have had. Small, small revelation. Small. Especially after giving that revelation and then it comes to pass. Then the whole church is hailing you. Hailing you. Odisha. Odisha. You know, to the extent that, you know, sometimes we are so confident to say that, oh, madakra na unyanemia in komshen etamiyem meshe. May the Lord deliver us from arrival mentality. And may we press on. Press on. Press on. Number three. Consecration. The weight of a man is not in his eloquence, but the death of his consecration. In Ecclesiastes chapter 10 verse 1, the Bible says that a bad Death flies makes the perfume ointment stink and causes it to give off a foul odor. Consecration. Beloved, God will only invest his grace in a life that is set apart for him. A life that is set apart for me. Anytime I'm speaking about consecration, I use an example. And uh, it's not meant to be offensive. But I use that to make a point. How many of us have seen Don Moin singing? Don Moin. Have heard him singing. I just want to be where you are. Dwelling daily in your presence. Take me to the place where you are. I just want to be with you. I want to be where you are. Dwelling in your presence. Feasting at your table. Surrounded by your glory. In your presence. That's where I always want to be. I just want to be, I just want to be with you. He will not modulate. He will not sing minor notes. The same voice, the same voice. Your steadfast love extends to the heavens. Your faithfulness reaches to the clouds. Your righteousness is the majestic mountains. La 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 of the sea. And you come to me. He's been married for more than 40 years. A life that is consecrated. We never read a scandal. We never had an issue. 
The same voice. Meanwhile, Where are the instrumentalists? Huh? Where's the drama? Bebo mami, bebo mami. Presiding, please forgive me. This is me. Some people will come and stand. Oh! And they will torment us. Jesus, Jesus, oh Jesus, Jesus, oh Jesus, Jesus, you're the Lord, oh Jesus. Oh. You know, what kills me cry? Is those of us who, after going to school, we will go and join the class. And when we come home, we want to come and let the church know that we have school Abba. And we are members of the university mass choir. We all in this church, before you left, we were singing Dana Se. Dana se awoda onyame na se. You went to school and you came. Hey, down Oh, 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 I'm not saying it's bad. It's not bad. But you see that after all those things, no power, no unction, nothing. So we just look at you and wonder when you finish, we'll clap for you. And you go and sit down. But a life that is consecrated, when the person stands and begins to sing, Look at our, our legendary, our father, Adam Riku. Now what they to me, bay. Ne soon soon bay. Ne no sra. Now what they bay. Ne to me, bay. Ne soon soon bay. And then him sent ya me do Jesus. Now also me bo kesi. O sane ma chin kwen chin ram. Ma bo for ya to me fi me bo ne ho. Ain't he says, He says, He says, He says, Lame legs are working. People are dropping their car keys. What is the secret? A consecrated life. A consecrated life. The man is sacrificed on the altar. And so when he appears, life is dispensed. Consecration. 
the authenticator of our ministration is how much we have consecrated our lives. How much we have consecrated our lives. God is not interested in how oratory you are or how eloquent you can sound or your skill and your dynamics. At the end of the day, it is to him. But when you consecrate yourself, it becomes the fire that cooks your ministration and prepares a good meal for your consumers to eat and they are satisfied. May we come to the place of consecration. We come there. We come there. You cannot assess grace if your life is not yielded and consecrated if some things are not stopped in your life, if some lifestyles are not dropped. Look at the number of hours we sit watching movies on Netflix. Netflix. 365 days. Me, I'm a media person, so I know everywhere. And you'll be watching. By the time you are done, your spirit man is contaminated. Meanwhile, you could use the whole night, even in your sleep, to be listening to a preaching tape. Thankfully, I see that you are on YouTube, this church. A lot of messages. They are too to play. Why wouldn't you have good dreams with messages like this? But you are watching Netflix. He said that garbage in, garbage out. Finally, then we can pray. If you want to assess grace, you must learn to be a worshiper. I was preaching not too long ago somewhere and I was saying that the easiest way of courting the grace of God is to be a worshiper. In fact, it's the simplest way. In Psalm 49, verse 4, King James, the Bible says that I will speak with Proverbs and I will reveal my dark sayings on the harp. I will reveal my dark sayings on a harp. One day, King Solomon understood the power of worship and sacrifice, dropped a thousand burnt offerings before God in Gibeon. And the Bible says that in the night, God appeared to him. So, there are activities that causes angels to come. And then there are activities that bring God himself. And one of that activity is the activity of worship. To be worshipful is to be powerful. To be worshipful is to be graceful. Show me a woman, a man who is an embodiment of a worship life. And I will show you a man with a signature of the grace of God written on him. Worship. Worship is a protocol for activating grace and activating power. The atmosphere of worship resounds the bells of power. Anytime an atmosphere of worship is created, you should expect that grace will be released. Power will be released. It just, it just works. It just works. It just works. To be intimate in worship is to decode the password of great grace. To be intimate in worship is to decode the password of grace. I have seen in my short period of ministry, that it works. It works. When everything has been said and done, 
and you are at your wet end, lift up your cup of worship and it will be filled with waters of grace and waters of power. You will leave that atmosphere and you can see drops and droplets of power on you. In Acts chapter 16, from the verse 25, the Bible says that at the stroke of midnight, Paul and Silas prayed and they worshipped. The Bible says that and the prisoners were listening to them. 26. The Bible says that suddenly there was a great earthquake. Worship provokes power. It provokes grace. So the foundations of the prison were shaken. And immediately, the Bible says that all doors, all doors, all doors were open. All doors. The prison warden's door was open. That's why he could come out. Because Abraham no had But in the atmosphere of worship, the door was open. Even the doors of those who have been declared, you know, when you go to in some own prisons, there are some of the prisoners, they have been declared. Those are the, the prisoners who are awaiting the death sentence. So they are condemned. Condemned. All doors, all doors were open. And the Bible says that everyone's chains were loosed. Everyone, everyone, grace descended, power descended, and chains were loosed. Tonight, as we lift up our voice to pray and worship, grace will come here. Power will come here. And I can guarantee you tonight that every door will be open. Every door, every door, every door, the door of healing will be open. The door to your next level will be open. The door to your promotion will be open. The door to deeper depths in the Lord will be open. Every door will be open. And every chain will be loosed. The chains of retrogression, the chains of backwardness, the chains of lack of confidence, the chains of affliction, the chains of brokenness, the chains of discouragement, the chains of despair, the chains of loss of hope, every chain will be broken. May that become your testimony. And as we rise to pray, anticipate an uncommon visitation. Can we rise? There is only one name. There is only one name with power to say. You can stretch a bit with power to save. There is only one name, say, there is only one name. There is only one name. There is only one name. to say power to say let's stay there there is only one name everybody say there is only one name there is only one name there is only one name when power to say
tongue will confess that Jesus and you are Lord. Yeah. And every knee will bow down. Every tongue will confess that Jesus. You are God. I am a Santa Baba. Our God, our God is a champion. Our God is champion. He
of the goodness of God. All my life you have been. All my life you have been. Faithful. All my life you have been so so good.
kados, 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 is the lamb, is the lamb of God who sits upon the throne. He alone, he alone is worthy of our praise. Kados, kados, kados. Yeah. <laughs>
what name fits you. into the place of grace and the place of power hearts are ready hearts are ready hearts are ready then I ask the Lord 